Warning, this content is for entertainment and educational purposes only. All right, folks, Big Paul here today with Freshly Minted IFBB Pro, Nick Justice. What's up, Nick? Not much, man. How's it going, Paul? Good, man. Congrats. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. It's uh, been a long time coming. It was definitely one hell of a journey. I'd be lying if I said I didn't miss prep. I I miss prep. I like doing prep, man. I don't know. Like, I always feel lost in the (laughs) offseason. I like the offseason. Like, I'm 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 not I'm a foodie, but I'm not food driven in prep. And I more so miss the off season for the memories that I'm able to make, you know, with family, friends, girlfriend, yeah. stuff like that. Cause I'm very when it comes to peak weeks for me, peak weeks are always like not the my hardest in terms of I'm I'm like super emotional, but I always tend to reflect a lot on peak weeks, like the happy memories from my family, you know, post show memories, you know, things that me and my girlfriend used to do before prep, you know. So I think though that's a good thing for me in peak week because it gives me something to look forward to after when after the shows, and especially after I turn pro, you know. And I like the off season for the memories I'm able to make, different experiences. But I mean, I it's gonna sound crazy, but I I enjoy dieting. I don't like the feeling of having a full stomach all the time in the off season because I can house food. Uh, but I love the feeling of being in prep, everything structured, waking up. And like there's a, a phrase that I used, you know, throughout my entire prep is the mission is the only thing that matters. And like that's that's constantly on your mind when you're in prep. Yeah, I like the structure and just having something to do every day. I feel a little bit off off center when I'm in the off season. But you are right, though. It's bodybuilding is a selfish sport and you have to put your family your loved ones on hold while you're on prep man it's just how it is sometimes and it's nice to you know have that emotional release afterwards and give them some of your time back you know you don't have any kids or anything do you no no i don't yeah i mean it changes too when you have kids it's it's even more complicated even more complicated but yeah i mean I, i i imagine all those emotions came pouring out when you got the pro card Dude, I'll tell you what, man. It was like, <laughs> so on prep, I, I so I've, I've never done trend before, except when we implemented it on prep. Uh, thankfully, I tolerated it very well. And the only thing that I really did not like about it is I became very dull and I became very emotionless. Yeah, And it didn't matter, you know, it, it almost like once I heard when I got my pro card, when I heard and your new IFBB pro, it was just like the floodgates opened, you know, and even though I hadn't been on trend since five days out, we pulled it out. It was it was like everything that was being unintentionally held in came out. And it was it was probably one of the, it was the best feeling in the world. Yeah. It was just it was amazing. And then the next day, just being, you know, out in New York City because we stayed in Jersey and then my girlfriend surprised me the next day. She uh, got us uh, two nights in a hotel room in Times Square. It was amazing. And I've been to New York City before and I stayed in Times Square, but. I think the biggest fulfilling, the, my most fulfilling moment of that week after turning pro, like the turning pro was the highest, like biggest fulfilling moment, seeing my girlfriend after the show, just ball, ball, just letting everything out bawling was felt so good. But the one thing that I, I remember every second of was after the show, we're doing tourist stuff. You know, we went to the top of the Empire State Building, which I've done before, but I just wanted to see her reaction and her experience to everything. And that really put a big thing in perspective of like, you know, if this woman went through an entire prep with me and she was with me before prep and she wasn't even into into bodybuilding when we first started dating, I was like, she, this, she's the one, like she went through this entire thing with me. She's enjoying this now, never complained a single time. And it was like, it, it was a very cool moment of taking a step back and like, yo, I know where I'm at. I'm meant to be doing this with this person. Yeah, that's really cool. My wife is a non-gym goer, a non-bodybuilder, and she's always very supportive. It's tough sometimes when you're with somebody that's, you know, I know some guys that's tough when you're with somebody that's a non-bodybuilder. Although I've seen some dudes that prep with their wives, and that's also (laughs) not great. Dude, I give John Jewett so much props for doing it with his wife. I'm going to out John a little bit. I hung out with him at the... um, 
I hung out with him at the Arnold Classic, and and we was talking to John, and I'm like, I'm like, so your wife's not prepping anymore? And he goes, No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and to, to I paraphrase, own, but it was something to that. To, something to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to the people that can do it, you know, effectively for each other, and especially to the sometimes when their partner is the one coaching them, like that's wild. That's got that's a whole other yeah. level. But, you know, there was also, you know, with like, for example, you said your wife, that's like a non-gym goer, not into the realm of bodybuilding. And because it's very niche, you know, when her, my girlfriend and I first started dating there, rightfully so, it was a big concern for her because I had only done one show at that point and I was 21 years old um, and it was a, it was a big concern for her. She's like, I'm not into this. It's like she kind of felt like she ex- had to be expected to get into bodybuilding, get into competing. I'm like, girl, I've dated girls in the past that were in the fitness industry, influencers, you know, competitors in the past, not, not the, the life that I want right now, you know? And it's <laughs> like, so it's like, cause I was practically like dating myself at that time, you know? And it was just like, I need to experience life with somebody instead of just experiencing bodybuilding with somebody. Yeah. So, it's nice and, to have an escape. Very true. So, and well, it's that's, better that's, when you, you can have that escape with somebody that also wants you to succeed with bodybuilding more than you know anything else which is great well that's cool that she's supportive and a fan of it now yeah that's that's perfect that's the perfect relationship to me i don't, I don't think i would want to date somebody that was deep into the sport <laughs> yeah it's uh it's a good and nice too that she's she wants to compete eventually now that she knows what bodybuilding is all about oh that's cool but which is really cool yeah because like she didn't really even know it was a sport back when her and i first started dating she didn't know like how serious things were, but then now, like right now she's in, uh, going through, um, her master's in nursing. Um, oh, awesome. so she, she just is like fully accepting of like, okay, I want to do wellness eventually. And I need a lot of tissue for wellness, especially for where, where that division's going and where it started. Um, and she's just accepting of the fact of like, okay, bodybuilding is not paying any of the bills, you know, for her, for her. And she's like, I got to first focus on, you know, my career solidify being a nurse and accept the fact that I'm not going to rush getting on stage, which is, I'm really glad, you know, where she's not going to rush potentially becoming enhanced, you know, and which is a whole other ballpark in terms of the female enhancements and female side of things. So she's just doing it for love right now. That's really cool. So what's next for you now that you got your pro card? Yeah, good question. So that was one thing I was kind of worried about after turning pro. Um, now I, I love men's physique, but my body wants to put on tissue very quickly. And I've been closer to 300 most of my off season more so than I have, you know, closer to like the two thirties and the 200 mark. And I was, after I turned pro, me and my coach had to have a talk. He's like, dude, I mean, we could do well in the pro leagues for men's physique, but he knows how hard I train, how much I love bodybuilding. And he's like, I don't want to get to the point where your off seasons are very limited in terms of what we can use, how many days per week you can train, afraid of, like uh, outgrowing the men's physique division. So and I told him, like, dude, I, I completely agree. Let's just see uh, where things go within my post show reverse. And so about three weeks after my show, I, on my third check in after the show, we sent Tyler Mannion my bodybuilding poses and men's physique poses. And we got feedback from him, like what we should do in terms of men's physique classic or go up to open and Tyler's like to be honest Nick's frame because he was the one that judged me at universe Nick's frame can hold a lot of weight he's I mean he's got a very wide x frame I'd rather see him do well in classic before you guys just try to push for open and just put on weight to put on weight since me being very young and he's like he could do well in physique but the sometimes you can't really beat those guys that have the genetic bubble to them you know yeah. So right now, that's what we're doing. We're transitioning into classic. Um, so that's how we're going to be uh, approaching my off season here soon. You know, and since my show, and I'm happy for that because that gives me for my my weight cap for classic, I believe two forty two, two forty two or two thirty nine. I forget which one, but which is how tall I mean, are you? A six one and a half. Oh yeah, so you're the same as me. Yeah. Yeah. So it gives me a lot of room to grow, and I'm really happy for that. Especially too, it, we can focus more so on building the classic look instead of just putting on tissue to put on tissue 
you know, because for, for me, this is bodybuilding. It's not body already built. You know, if I have to limit the amount my body can grow by just staying in men's physique and limiting the amount that I train legs, like I'm not going to like that. So I'm just, I'm excited. We're going to classic and this is, it just got blood work done on Tuesday this past week. So yes, it's my show. I mean, I'm already up to 240 and uh, on stage when I turned pro, I was 217. So um, wow, yeah. And that's, believe it or not, I, since my show, I've been on 200 megs of test and three, I use a growth and my body. I mean, I still have my, my glutes are still square. You know, I can still feel the striations on my glutes and my body. Like I said, just wants to grow. So food is adequate to fuel my training, my recovery, my workouts feel amazing. So my body is just my, that my anabolics post show were besides my TRT and, and at Sarah stem, it was literally just the food and the training and a surplus. Yep. Man, when I saw your pics the first time and I, and I'm like, Oh my God, this guy, this guy's going to explode. He's not, <laughs> he's not a men's physique guy. You, you know who you remind me of? I don't know if you know, Matt Grego. Yes. Yeah, you remind me a lot of Matt. I remember seeing Matt when he first turned pro, and I'm like, oh, man, this dude's not going to last long in <laughs> men's physique. He's going to blow past this in no time. You can see it. Like, some guys, that's their genetic limit that's just as big as they can get, where you're just getting started, man. Like, I can look at your physique and see, like, you're just – like, you probably, you know, could do open down the road if you mm -hmm. want it. I think um, so, too. And that's something that I'm definitely open to down the road. And I'm more so open to that because, thankfully – I still, I mean, being young, obviously I got a clean bill of health. Um, you know, things will fluctuate depending on, especially contest prep cycles and stuff like that, and just stressors. But thankfully I tolerate gear well in terms of how it affects my, my internal health well as well, which I'm very happy for, which makes me more susceptible to the idea of going up divisions, which is, you know, It'd be, it'd be irresponsible of me to be like, yeah, let's push classic. Let's push open. If I knew my body would always take a hit in a negative direction, you know, after cycles. I mean, that's a genetic thing that people don't consider. I mean, I see it all the time. You, I mean, I'm sure if you work with clients, you see it, man, you get some guys, their blood work goes to shit on just TRT. Yeah. And then, and then I got other dudes that are running grams and it's like nothing even affects them. <laughs> yeah. I know and it's so, wild. An ability to respond to and have a tolerance to the PEDs is an important attribute for being a successful bodybuilder. I totally agree. I think people are more so, I think people are more so focused on the, the thought of, am I a hyper responder? Do I hyper respond physically and visually to PEDs? Do I do that well or do I not? But I think people need to take a step back and realize, am I a hyper tolerator can i tolerate yeah. this thing this stuff well internally because that's what's going to cause somebody to have a successful career in the pro leagues or even turn pro it at all yeah so and i think that's something people overlook and but i thankfully i think it's i mean platforms like yours and steve's man chase irons you know personally for me i've learned so much from all three of you guys and i think that's what they're they're breaking the mold of like you guys this is the shit that matters most than you know, how big, just generally how big you can get within a two year span. Um, so I'm, I'm glad. I mean, I can't tell you how many guys I've seen blow their load, <laughs> so to speak, turn a pro and then they, they can't compete. They're so sick and fucked up by the time they turn pro they're done. They have to mm -hmm. retire. Mm -hmm. And, it's and pretty I, wild. to me, it's like, what's the point? Yeah. Especially too. It's, it's even more sad when that person potentially for, from a structural standpoint, could do really damn good in the pro leagues. Yeah. So. I mean, we've all seen those guys. Dude, dude it was wild at your your first show this year. Um, I know we talked about it, a little bit about it beforehand, but it looked like to me that you downsized between shows, did you? Yeah, so that first show, <laughs> um, that first show. I'm like, I'm, I'm, this has got to be deliberate. Like, he pulled off some size to. Yeah. So the first show going into it, we knew we still we had to take about, 10, we could take about 10 pounds off for that show before junior nationals, which was going to be four weeks after that show. And we knew going into it, like, especially to my coach, knowing some of the, the competition in Georgia, because I'm, I, I'm located in Milwaukee. My coach Cameron is lives in Georgia. So I went down there for a week, lived with him, and then did the show. And he was like, you know, we're not going to do anything crazy for the show. We're going to come in. I'm going to do a little bit of water manipulation, just to get some the film water off. Didn't use any diuretics for it. Nothing crazy at all for peak week, you know, because we knew like we just got to get that qualification. And after that show, 
between that show because it did go as we expected. So it was original plan. Like I told you, it was going to go the first show in Georgia, four weeks later, junior nationals. And that was the original plan. Didn't go to plan. Was center the entire time for the last 10 seconds where they moved to the, me to second for the people listening. And then for finals came around, I ended up in third. We don't know how, um, especially too, when you look at who's on stage. But the between that first show and the show that I did two weeks later, which was the one I won the overall at, at Battle at the River in Chattanooga, Tennessee, weight was flying off. The only difference that from my first show in Georgia that we changed, but the only difference is, excuse me, from that show to my second show two weeks later was we dropped my, my, my test probe down to 80 milligrams a day and then trend stayed at 25 milligrams a day. Um, oh, and then mass went from 80 to 100. And there was that, and then we pulled food down at bare, probably around 130, 150 calories uh, yeah, that's from my bad. baseline. And my and we kept kept cardio the same. Cardio was at 400 cardio calories fasted, and my body just was clicking into play. And from that, from Georgia was 234, 235 on stage to battle at the river. Um, I was about 15 pounds leaner in that two weeks. I was laughing. I think it was the first show. There was a picture of you standing up there, and there was a dude in the background looking at you, and he you could see the look on his face. He was like, "Oh fuck!" Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was it was funny when I was when I was getting my tan done. I was the only one back there because I was one of the last sessions the day before. And getting the tan done, and then some guy comes back, and this this happened to be the guy that took first place at this show for men's physique. Um, and him and I are just ch- talking. He's like. Are you classic? I'm like, no, I'm physique. And he's like, oh fuck me. And he he was all he was all worried and shit. And then he's like, dude, I'm probably gonna get do terrible at this show. And because he was back behind a bunch of meals and had just like two burgers right before tanning and stuff, ended up winning that show. And then after he was like, he came up to me and he's like, Man, I'm just as surprised as you are. And I'm like, Yep, <laughs> me too. <laughs> I mean that happens. I've had that happen before. Well, anyway, you got the pro card now, so that yeah. <laughs> that's all that's all that matters. Let's let's talk about your prep a little bit. How far out did you start? Was it sixteen week or? So personally, myself and my coach are more of a fan of longer preps. I like longer preps because my rate of loss we can extend it a little bit more. I have more time for to have higher food. Not get. I mean, we started prep at twenty four weeks out. From oh wow, my, that's a long my, prep. I I enjoy it. Personally, that's how I like doing things for my clients. I like 20, 22 weeks out. Very seldomly, I'll do something under 16 weeks out at all for somebody unless they're in a position where they're pretty lean the way it is. So yeah, prep was 24 weeks out from my first show. And in total, I was in prep for 30 weeks. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I lose weight so fast. I Like 10, 12 weeks is all I need to get ready for shows. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You're lucky. It's that personally for me, like it's not that I get ready. I don't get ready quick. Like myself and fat loss go hand in hand. It's just like for me, I can flatten out very easily and it takes a lot of food to keep me full. And yeah, if I flatten out for, for too long, then it's going to be harder to fill me back up. Yeah, you can't come back from it. Yeah, yep. I'm the same way. Well, that's a problem, I think, with tall guys. Yeah. I've seen that with a lot of tall guys. We got a lot more real estate to fill out. Yeah, I mean, I you know, with that said, I you, usually when I do prep, I'll start twenty weeks out, just tightening things up, doing a little bit of cardio, tightening my food up, and then there's like a twelve week period where I push, just yeah. to be clear, and then we fill back up going into the shows. Yeah, for the first like four weeks of my prep, I was still only I was still on my TRT dose of one hundred fifty mg of test at that time, so that was just you know still getting into the groove of things like that pre prep phase, you know, yeah. getting my body a little responsive. Um, and then we, and around that 20 week out mark, we started to bring doses up a little bit more of test and primo. What did your cycle look like for the show? Yeah, so I can actually pull that up. I, if I, off the top of my head, my starting test like dose. You, it sounds like you titrate up. I do sort of the same thing. Yeah. Uh, I, I find that I get less side effects that way when I titrate up. Definitely. Um, yeah, so when we started, yeah, so the first four weeks of my prep, I was on 150 megs of test, brought it up to 250 for another four, and then my test um, went up to 600, Primo was introduced at, at 400 at that same time, 
And then, so that's what the initial start of that cycle. Test got up to 750 eventually for test E. Uh, Primo went up to 550 at that point too. That was six weeks into prep. And then around the, what week out was this? Around, excuse me. It's all in these spreadsheets. I'm trying to match up with the weeks. Around six weeks out, we brought my, my Primo down to 350. And then it had Anavar in at 25 milligrams. And then we pulled at five weeks out. We pulled my test E, replaced it with test P at 100 mg per day. Primo pulled out at 80 milligrams per day of mast pro. And then we in- introduced Tren at eight weeks out at 30 milligrams every other day to see how I tolerated it. 25, my Winstrol only got up to 25 milligrams on the entire prep. Uh, wow. Provi- Proviron was at 50 milligrams and then we got it up to 150 in the morning with meal one, 50 with meal five. And then into my peak weeks, uh, we introduced Halo. So I'd have Halo in at 10 milligrams every day. And then I got it to 30 milligrams of Halo on, th- it was either two or three days out. Um, and then my growth hormone actually was pulled out right after my first show. And then we didn't reintroduce that at all, which I did think I did lose some fullness from. Yeah, um, you will, but it's yeah. a game you play with the with being dry versus yeah. fullness. And then T3 I mean, and T4 a- were in there. We just had replacement doses of T3 and T4 for morning and PM administrations. Klein only got up to 60 micrograms. Yohimbine. I know you're not a fan of Yohimbine. I, I love Yohimbine, to be honest. Here's the thing with Yohimbine. It works well for about 60% of people. And then some people get really bad nausea yeah. from it. And I'm one of the ones that gets really bad nausea. It's not that I dislike it. It's just I don't tolerate it. Would you get the cold sweats from it? I get the It's like I have the flu, man. Oh, yeah. I, I had that my first prep in 2021. And we only got it to I mean, five milligrams. I have these waves of nausea where I feel like I need a trash can to go throw up. And uh, yeah, and it just it just makes me feel sick. And the, But some people don't get that. So I'll run it with my clients. Yeah, that's a baby cycle, man. If you can yeah. turn pro, if you can turn pro on that, then you got a lot of runway. Yeah, it's I mean, in terms of like my injectables, the only the highest my injectables got up to when we took the longer esters out and replaced them with fast est- esters was 560 test. 560 mast, 280 trend, 25 Winstrol, 100 Proviron, up to 30 milligrams of Halo. Uh, and then obviously peak week manipulation of, you know, AIs, um, stuff like that. So yeah, we didn't do any anything crazy with AIs, but I'm just glad that I tolerated a trend well, because prep would have been not the funnest if, if trend was <laughs> causing me issues. It was weird with Trent with me. Like, I didn't have a problem with it until I got older. And then it kind of started causing problems with me. I don't, the main thing with me is I just can't sleep when I'm on it. Mm, gotcha. See, for me, I never experienced anything. Like, dude, I sweat like crazy all the time, year round yeah, when too. I'm training. Um, I, was, I, was, I, I did notice I was more warm uh, when I was sleeping, when I was on trend, especially during the nighttime. It never affected my sleep in a negative way. To be honest, I think. Like I was up at 6 a.m. a quarter to six almost every single day on prep once trend was implemented, but I was still getting a full eight hours in. Like I would, I would go to bed um, early and even to this day, my body is still in a mode of getting up early. So the one good thing that came from trend besides the pro card was that <laughs> I, I get up early as hell. So, <laughs> Well, I, I know the part you talked about being emotionalist. That's the kind of the way I feel like it doesn't. I don't get angry or anything. I just become apathetic. Like, I just don't give a fuck about anything. Yeah, it was... Like, I don't care about your feelings. <laughs> yeah, literally. It was really weird, too. I mean, I loved the way it made me, made me feel when I was training. Especially strength when I'd pose after the gym. Like the, you know, what people say, like the God complex. You know, I felt yeah. great on it in the gym. Um, it didn't ever give me anxiety. I've never been a very high anxious person. Personally, I noticed a little bit more anxiety when I've ran NPP in my off seasons. Yeah. Same um, with me. and I, I like NPP, but we can get into that later. But with, with me, with trend, man, like I'm a very, I'm a people person. I'm extroverted. I like, you know, telling different, me and my girlfriend have different conversations, you know, deep conversations, good conversations, me and my friends, like intellectual conversations. And it honestly felt like me. Once I reached 40 milligrams of trend a day, it felt like I kind of had to put a fake smile on. 
and I had to, yeah. you know, if I was at the gym and I was with my buddies or if I was on my podcast with my friends, like I'd have to kind of be like, okay, try to act like your old self right now. And it, I didn't like the way it made me feel at all. And once that was pulled out, I was like, thank God. Yeah, I have a little bit of social anxiety to begin with, and I definitely don't want to be around people. And I have zero tolerance for people texting on machines while I'm on trend. <laughs> Dude, bro, for my similar, what's similar to me for that is when I'm on trend and I'm in the gym and I see somebody doing cardio, holding the handles, or if they're pushing down <laughs> on the stair stepper, I have caught myself so many times just staring at these people. <laughs> like there was one time in the gym filming a YouTube video and my videographer is, is I'm just sitting there resting between sets. And he's, I didn't know he was recording, but he's just recording me. And he takes the camera, pans it over to somebody just leaning over the stair step or pushing down on it. And I'm just shaking my head. And I had no idea I was doing it. <laughs> and I'm like, and he sent it to me after. He's like, bro, you got to chill. I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> I had this poor kid in my gym that was taking a little too long on a machine and he was taxing. And I asked him if I could work in. And he was like, uh, I've got two more sets. And I'm like, wrong answer, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I think, and I'm usually yeah. not like that. No, same here. The one time that I ha have noticed like any sort of like snappy moment, I was snippy when I was on trend, and my girlfriend can attest to that. And you know, I was, I definitely could tell when I was snippy, not in terms of saying anything mean. I was just like one word answer sometimes. But when I first pulled my natty card, I and mean, we went from 150 makes a test to 250, I remember it was the most simple thing. I was in college at the time. And I was sending a posing video to one of, or no, I was taking a, a video of me doing an exercise and sending it's going to be sending it to my coach. And one of my buddies was fucking around in front of my phone just very quickly because he knew I was recording. And I like got up and I got into his face. I'm like, dude, I'm sending this to my fucking coach. Don't mess around like now. And then I realized I was like, that, that's not me. And he was shocked. And that was only on 250 a week. And then that's the only thing. But I will say, Halo definitely is gets me pretty irritable uh, so i'm just glad i wasn't on, ever on halo when i was on trend halo does the opposite to me man i feel like i feel like a million bucks on halo i feel i feel like a million bucks but i do notice my aggression comes through easier i'd say yeah yeah i can see that yeah what did your diet i mean what you know what kind of diet did you run yeah so we kept food pretty high and for a majority of my prep and it wasn't because I was expending a whole lot of calories with cardio, um, but I'm a very active person the way it is, regardless of me being a full-time coach and being on my computer a lot. I mean, I go on a lot of walks. I stay active. I do a lot of my walks for digestion. So my body just cranks through calories. So in terms of my food, I mean, I was on uh, five meals a day. We never once did a carb cycle. You know, we did do low carb days, high carb days, moderate dig days, things like that. The only time I would have very high food is when my coach would be like, hey, man, I want you to check in with me three days after today with, with my check-in day. Or if you dip below X amount of weight, check in with me again. Because he knew around my big weight drops where I'd be really flat and then he would refeed me. Um, there's points on your coach? Uh, Cameron Cheek. Oh, yeah. Cameron's a technician, man. Yeah, Cameron. He, he, dude, I've learned so a, much from Cameron. He's a scientist, man. He's been my coach ever since stuff. the beginning when I was, even when I was natural and he mentors me to this day and it's, I'm always learning new stuff from him and he's, he's awesome, dude. Um, I've never talked to him directly. I need to interview him sometime, but I have some friends that work with him and he seems like he knows his shit. Very smart. And he's very, um, he's there for you when you need it. He's very, he's the type of person where when, when he can sense on prep that the athlete may be in their head a little bit or stressed out, he's very good at squashing that and not, not saying, That's Hey, awesome, Nick, Nick, you're stressed out. You need to stop, but he'll redirect to something else. He will bring things up knowing how it'll pull on my heartstrings a little bit. And I think that's huge. And that's something that I've learned as a coach myself is making sure that my clients know that, that if they're stressed, I'm not stressed because they'll, they'll get a read on that as well. And he's just so good at that. That's the secret sauce of prepping people, man. Like, I don't think people realize, I don't know how many people are prepped at this point. It's been hundreds, but it, it's, you're more psychi psychiatrist than you are, psychologist than you are an actual bodybuilding coach a lot of times. Very true. Especially when, when gear is in play, you got to know how these things could potentially be affecting somebody's behavior and psyche. 
Yeah, it's gear and food depletion, and then like your mind starts playing tricks on you, yes. and there's a lot of shit that happens. Did, were there moments of self doubt on your prep? Did you like get in your head sometimes? There was. There was moments of self doubt. I would definitely say there was moments of self doubt between my between junior nationals and universe, um, because there was a point between the two weeks between those shows that we had to flatten out pretty quite a bit just to come in with more detail for my back. And we never lost tissue from my back within that time period, but I was getting worried that I was hitting my back pose wrong. Cause I couldn't, when you're flat, it's harder to feel muscles yep. when you're, especially in the men's physique pose, when you're not squeezing that muscle and flexing it super hard, you're, you're supposed yep. to be relaxed and composed. So I got in my head a little bit. I'm like, dude, my back pose looks like shit. And you know, I was like, dude, did I lose tissue? Am I opening it up enough? And then I started posing differently. And then, you know, Joey belts, my posing coach. And he was like, Hey man, you're in your head a little bit here with your posing. Cause I can tell you're trying to overpose. And that was yep. feedback that we got from junior nationals of not to overpose. And so, yeah, I got in my head a little bit there. Um, but I also, there was a point I got in my head about just life in general on prep. And there was a point it was, I was pretty emotional at one point in prep just from some external life things happening. And there was just a conversation I had to have with my girlfriend. I was really worried how life would be like after prep. And if it wasn't for her and how she helped me get through that, just for that time period, it was, I mean, it was like a 24 hour, just, you know, I was in the mud, you know, I was just like, what's going on. And should I be in this position right now? Am I taking away time from you and your family and my family? You know, if it wasn't, wasn't for that realization of like, Hey, this is the prep. This is the stress. This is the depletion yeah. of food right now. Um, you know, if it wasn't for her helping me see that, then things would have been differently. But I think it's normal for people to get in their head on prep. Um, oh, yeah. Everybody rightfully rightfully so. You know, and like I had a guy yesterday, one of my open guys competing. He's like, hey, man, I don't know if I'm big enough to compete at a regional show or a national level. And I'm like, I just, all I had to say was, if I didn't think you were ready, you would not be in this position right now. I would have squashed this right away, you know, and everybody happens with open guys, with men's physique guys, with natural guys, with enhanced guys. So yeah, I'm sure you've been in that same position. Oh, every, every show, man. Yeah. I, you know, when, this year when they were calling out the, at finals and they called out third place, second place, they had me lined up in second one on stage. And then they didn't call They didn't have me in center. And then they didn't call my name for a second. I'm like, fuck, man, I missed it again. Damn. And then and then they called me for the overall. I was like, holy shit, man. <laughs> like, like I was like, it was like this wave of like emotion, like both ways came yeah. over me, man. Yeah. I thought, for, I, do. I thought for sure I'd missed it again. And I was like, I think I'm done if I missed it again because I'm getting old, oh, man. It's like not like I'm gonna be Mr. Olympia or anything, but there was a point in prep where I definitely was in my head before my first show quite a bit. Because my first show ever was 2021, and I was a natural at that time. Um, an amazing experience. I got absolutely inside out peeled. Loved it. And that's when I was hooked. And then, but I took a three year off season to build, you know, to put tissue on. And I, before my first show, there was definitely a, a point in me. I was like, man, like, am I going to be able to present myself how I need to present myself on stage? Am I truly ready? I haven't competed yeah. in three years. Am I going to make a fool of myself? Like all these things that are running through my head. Did I practice yeah. posing enough? Did I, do I have enough core control? Can I hold the poses long enough? Am I going to start yeah. sweating all this stuff, you know? And, but it's like, you need those emotions and you need to be aware of those emotions. So if shows after that, you know what to avoid yeah. in terms of the spirals that you start to go into. Yeah, I don't know how guys prep themselves. I, I have like there's there's been only been a handful of people in bodybuilding history that successfully have done it. Like I think about Dorian Yates, he never had a coach. Like wow. how the hell how the hell did he do that? Yeah. And it's it's wild. You get a very select few people that I can even do it successfully, like Dorian. You know, and I I had somebody asked me on a Q, on a Q&A the other week. They're like, what are your thoughts on self-coaching? You know, would you ever do it? Did you do it? Um, and to paraphrase what I said, I was like, no, I won't do it because if I have my, this, whatever potential I may have, I don't want to put that decision-making into my own hands, regardless of how much I know, regardless of the people I've, you know, put on stage, the people that I've helped attain these goals with. And another comparison I made for this person was like a lot of, I've, I'm sure you've seen this, 
a lot of people that try to self coach for their first show or their all their shows and they more times than not they don't come in hitting the mark they don't come in condition no. they come in too flat and every show they do after that they don't hit the mark either because their first show that's their standard now that's what they think they should be looking like yeah on stage and they try to get a little bit better they don't know what's truly what it truly feels like look like or, or what it feels like to be peeled or how to get truly stage lean what a peak week is like so why would i ever have my my potential be compromised by an unrealistic standard when i could have be placing those decisions in the hands of somebody else that knows much more than me that's going to hold me to a standard of their best athletes too and i just think a lot of it, more so than not man like if 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 self coaching was what it was chopped up to be or what if it was that easy i mean chris bumstead would be doing it you'd be doing it De derek would be doing it you know it's, this is this is the only sport where dudes have del deluded themselves into thinking they can coach themselves like yes. I, I, an nfl football player would never in a million years think of not of you know Tom, Tom Brady has an athletic trainer. Tom Brady has a nutritionist. Tom Brady has a quarterback. Well, when he played, had a quarterback coach <laughs> and a head coach, right? I mean, these guys surround themselves with the best people yep. to put the best version of themselves out there on the field. I don't know why. It's no different for bodybuilding. Exactly. And I think by you and I saying that, being in the positions that you and I are in, um, of being coaches, I think sometimes people that don't understand our perspective of how important coaching for a prep is and an off season as well if you truly need to put on the correct amount of tissue in the right ways i think a lot of people are going to be like oh nick and paul are only saying this because they want your money in the off season or they just want you to you just they just want to coach you and then it's like no we want to see the entire sport of bodybuilding grow and we want to see yeah. everybody's experience of competing be the best one possible and that's not why we're saying hire a coach it doesn't have to be you or i it just has to be somebody that's going to bring you in at your best potential. I mean, I'm not short on clients, so I don't need clients. <laughs> <laughs> That's not an issue. Uh, no, I, I, believe me, if I'm, I'm not trying to overdo myself. I, I'm i in a position where I like to pick and choose who I'm with. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at too. But I, like, I just, you know, it's just, guys, if you, if you like, if, if you want to be the best, you have to work with mentorship. I mean, I, I I've been I've had some success in business in my life, and I've bought and sold a couple businesses over the years, and and been a CEO and and of other people's businesses. And one of the things I've like learned in business is like I've always paid for mentorship. Like I've yes. always gone to seminars. I've always had had people I can bounce ideas off of because it's extremely difficult to be objective about yourself and look in the mirror and give. An honest assessment of yourself you know man like i like just contest prep like i, I remember looking at my pictures and i'm like man i don't look good yeah and then and then you're, you're like two months later you look back and you're like what the fuck was i thinking yeah i know it's so you're not in a state to make decisions when you're thinking like that exactly you're not in a state to make decisions and also too you're not in a state to make decisions for if you look good or if you look poorly and also, too, a lot of guys are already going to have a predetermined bias as well. Like, my weight's down two pounds today. I need a refeed. But do you need a refeed or do you want a refeed? You know what I'm saying? Oh, no. I, I see that all the time. I call that the skinny fat phase, man. Like, dudes, yep. I, <laughs> they'll get about eight weeks into a prep or a diet. And, you know, I, I call it the skinny fat phase because you start looking smaller and you're not cut yet and you're getting weaker in the gym. And dudes push the panic button. They're like, like, fuck this, man. I'm going to eat some yeah. food. I'm losing all my size. Yeah. And it's the worst thing you can do. You just got to bust through that plateau. I think a huge thing, too, that people don't think about when it comes to the decision making on prep and them being self-coached and how it can be very detrimental is a lot of guys don't know how to manage their fatigue and manage their stress on prep. Oh, yeah. So, so what they're going to end up doing is they think that the best thing once they get very fatigued and, you know, the, a lot of this biofeedback is coming to them where they are getting shit sleep, poor training sessions, not good pumps, you know, X, Y, Z. They tend to try to fix their poor fatigue management with increasing the amount of drugs that they're taking. They're going to increase yeah. their clen. They're going to increase, increase their trend so they can be stronger in the gym. And where they don't realize that that decision is putting them in a worse spot. And they oh, don't yeah. know that they're stressing themselves out even more. 
more drugs does not mean more results. And I think that's a huge, huge job of a coach is to help them, well, obviously help them manage that fatigue, but a, a coach needs to know how to manage that fatigue apart from just the pharmacology of things. What I've been doing, man, once I get somebody fat free, like I work, this is something I learned from AJ. I, I kind of kind of came to this conclusion independently, but AJ confirmed it for me. But once I have somebody fat free, what I'll do is I'll program in some refeed days or a yeah. high day, and I'll have people take off all the fat burners, everything on those days, mm -hmm. just so they can get some sleep and get their CNS a break and recharge and it's worked freaking fantastically but you got to be fat free first that's the yeah. that's the caveat you, yes. you can't be 12 percent body fat and feeling feeling a little you know a little soft or a little small or whatever and, and think you need that but you got to get exactly. fat free first i i tell a lot of guys they're like what do i do on a refeed do i pull for, uh, for instance today i had one of my contest prep guys check in he had a huge weight drop in the past few days on average he's down four pounds in a week but in flattened out quite a bit I'm like, all right, man, we're going to refeed you today. No clen, no yo him bind, no cardio, cutting yep. your steps in half. And I'm like, you're at 12,000 steps per day. I want you to get in barely 6,000. That for me on prep was one of the hardest things was on my refeeds when coach told me, hey, cut your activity in half, be a lazy fuck today. I did not yep. know how to do that. Like I, I'm not a, I'm not a guy. To, I, I don't play video games a lot. I got a, the first ever gaming system I ever purchased was for when I was in Tennessee for my show for the Battle of the River. First ever gaming system ever in my entire life. And I bought a PS5. I played that PS5 one time since my show. And, or since my, I turned pro because I, I like to be active. So that was super hard for me. I didn't realize like, yep. damn, the reason I keep getting even more flat after a refeed is because I'm still getting in 12,000, 13, 14,000 yeah, steps 12, a day. And then, and then it's, you're not gonna, fill back up if you're running your him buying and yep. all this you know all the, all the fat burners and stuff too yeah if so the, if the entire premise is to pull stress down and not expend calories and why am i going to have clen you know him buying high steps and cardio in there and it's just something that again when i talk when it comes to the decision making i would say most guys work too hard or not, I mean, sorry, most guys don't work hard enough, but there are the guys that work too hard. Like, you have to save them from themselves. I, I've severely over dieted before. I, I remember I came in a show 185 one time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to be the most shredded guy on stage, man. And then, and then, yeah. That's know, that something happens. too. I mean, you all, you also see those guys where you see them. It doesn't, it, not even like one of your clients, but you see some like a friend of a friend or somebody online that you follow. They start prep looking amazing. They get on stage and they're peeled, but they lost so much tissue. And I think a huge yeah. issue with uh, young competitors is that when they really start to feel prep hit them and they start to feel shittier um, and they're not managing their fatigue, they don't realize that they're putting themselves in such a worse position by trying to manage their fatigue by training less or, or training with less intensity. And then they lose tissue. Because they're not giving their body a reason to keep that tissue. And then they get on stage, you know, they've lost 40 pounds on prep, but 20 of those pounds are tissue. You know, yeah. you'll see a change too. Like I've noticed, and I don't know if you've worked with any older competitors. I have to be way more careful with older competitors than younger guys. Younger guys are more resilient. You can you can push them harder and yeah. keep them. But I, I literally want sometimes like with guys that are over 40 off to have them take a day off or or do stuff like that. I would rather them do that than, than dial back their, their training intensity. Yes. I have a client right now. He's a men's physique guy and he's 54, 55. And he, we just got, he what six weeks ago. He had operation on his knee. He's a veteran. I mean, he's seen a lot of shit when he was at war. Um, but after surgery, he's like, all right, man, what are we doing? When am I going to be back in the gym? Yeah. What, when are we going to br bring the cycle up? And I'm like, dude, that's not going to do you any good right now. Where we, I mean, dude, you just had a, 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 got your knee replaced. Do you want to get back on cycle right now? Like, okay, testosterone is important for healing, but 800 megs of test is not going to do you any good right now. Yeah, that's a guy that's going to work too hard. You, you, yep. And that's the nuance of doing this stuff, man. Like, you have to know the psychology of the person that you're working with. Mm -hmm. I would say most people you have to push, but there are a few that you have to pull back. I see a, a huge, yeah, I mean, pulling back. I'd rather pull back than 
oh, way easier. Try, they'd constantly try to motivate somebody because I way think a key, a key car- characteristic for like an elite athlete is I'm I catch myself telling them to pull back more than I'm telling myself to put more telling them to put oh, more effort yeah. into their protocol. You don't have yeah guys that are at the top. You don't have to tell them to work harder unless they just no. have freak genetics. Exactly. It's, I'd way rather have it that way than constantly try to hold the, the hand of every single person. We all know there are some super freaks that could just mow lawns and, and, and be on the Olympia stage. Dude, I don't get it. Speaking of mowing lawns, that's how I get my steps in on prep. <laughs> <laughs> I'd mow my lawn like three times a week. <laughs> There's, I, like, I think Ronnie Coleman probably could have been Mr. Olympia pretty much no matter how he trained. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very true. <laughs> There's some people that I was lucky enough to see that guy in his prime, man. And that, that I've never seen a human being that big. That's so cool. Did, wait, did you ever uh, go to any of his shows? Yeah, yeah. I've seen him before. Yeah. Damn. Did you what, what, Did you see him ever compete at the Olympia? No, I didn't go to the Olympia. I saw him guest post one time. I don't remember where it was. I saw Dorian guest pose in the 90s, too, oh, wow. at the New York Pro. And that was crazy, man. That's um, cool. When he was Samson is the closest I've seen to a guy up close that's that's comparable to Ronnie. Samson is I've trained with Samson. I've been in the same gym as him doing photo shoots. There's one person in this entire world that makes anybody around them look small, and it's Samson. And even when even when Nick Walker was with Hostile and Samson has been with Hostile since I've been with them, Samson would tower even Nick, and Nick's a freak of nature, you know, yeah. Samson is just in, even in regular clothes, you know, whenever I'm at dinner with Samson and the team, it, it never ceases to amaze me. Just his size. I think he's the biggest bodybuilder on the planet right now. You know, <laughs> and, and to me, he looks like, he also seems like such a nice guy. He is. I knowing him personally with, you know, just with hostile and outside of hostile, he and him, him and I've had, more conversations of outside of bodybuilding than inside of bodybuilding about bodybuilding, you know, especially what all the, the pandemic, the COVID stuff about what he, he experienced in, in the UK, you know, and him telling me that experience Ian, cause I'm very vocal about that stuff and how I was almost expelled from college about that. He, he was, he, I mean, he's very open. He's also very open to hearing other perspectives of anything, which is really cool, which is, a, which is a trait nowadays. Not many people have. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, he seems like a super chill guy. All right, dude, I got to wrap this up. Is there anything you want to promote? Where can people get hold of you? I'll put your contact information in the video description. Oh Yeah. Yeah. No worries. You can find me on Instagram. All my YouTube stuff is on the hostile YouTube channel, potentially starting my own. You can follow my Instagram at underscore Nick justice. You've code Nick 10 at hostile. Nick 10 at Chula, uh, Chula styles for board shorts, but trunks now because I'm classic. So yeah, you're not yeah, going to wear those board shorts for much longer, man. No, I tore th- three or four inseams on shorts over prep. So they kept sending yeah. me pairs. Yeah, you're out. You've outgrown those. <laughs> yeah, quite a bit. <laughs> All right, dude. Thank you for coming on. Absolutely. My pr- pleasure, man.